Thank you very much, Marianne, and uh, it's great to see you all in a nice way to kick off the fall season, despite the uh, unfall-like temperatures. Um, and I, I just say, I was, I was really interested when, when this book came out. Uh, I've been in contact with John's publicist for, I don't know, six or eight months, uh, or something like that. Um, this is you know, a fascinating book, very interesting book, and just for any of you who might be you know, concerned, it, it doesn't have an ideological or political bent. Uh, like I was mentioning to John in the car, there are probably very few people who have very high level experience uh, within the SEC, in private equity, uh, sorry, in the private equity, in, in, in private practice and M&A work, uh, and then also meet for many years at the highest levels of academia. So you're someone who's really seen it all, researched it all, um, this book is really, uh, I suppose, your kind of, you know, launch for most of the American public to kind of get an idea of what this issue is, because in a lot of ways these are topics, concerns, um, that a lot of the American public isn't, you know, aware of. Can you talk about why you felt a need to write this book, you know, what you mean by the, you know, the problem of 12, and, and maybe just in terms of setting the parameters and guidelines for people to understand uh, how you're defining you know, kind of index funds, in particular maybe the big four, uh, and then private equity as well, and the big four there as well. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to be here. Everybody hear me okay in the back? Great. A little louder. A little louder. How's that? Good. All right. Um, so, I, as mentioned, I've been teaching uh, business sides of law and legal side of business at the law school and at the business school at Harvard for 25 years longer than I care to remember sometimes. And before that, I was a practicing lawyer doing M&A uh, in, uh, in New York for what seemed like several hundred years, but was, I think, only 10, about. Um, and then more recently, I went to the SEC for a year. Uh, during COVID, that was the only way my wife would let me, because um, we, we didn't actually go to the office. I did it all from home, so it was possible in a way that, that, uh, that it otherwise wouldn't be. So that's the sketch of my background. <laughs> While teaching at Harvard, uh, I was asked a few years ago to do a basic overview of how companies are governed for the business students, sort of a legal take, but, but educating the MBAs. And, and towards the end of that, I wrote that and we gave it to them, and, and towards the end of it, they said, also, tell us what's changing, what's new? And so I sort of took a step back and I asked myself, uh, compared to when I was a young lawyer back in the early 90s, what really has changed in the way that companies are owned and governed? And this book is the outcome of thinking about that. Um, the, the two, there are three big changes. The book only covers two. The third one, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, is globalization, which was not anywhere near it as, as it was back then. It's really changed the way companies function, but set that aside. The two other big changes um, are the rise of index funds. Vanguard is probably the best known one, um, but the, there are four, really, that are dominating the asset management space. Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, and then Fidelity, which is traditionally was not an index fund provider, but actually that's most of their money now, also index. So index funds, okay? And then private equity funds, which used to be called buyout funds, but then they realized that was a bad brand. So they rebranded as private equity funds in the 1990s. Now they're rebranding again, they're calling themselves growth capital, but it's basically the same functioning structure. So, all right, those two kinds of funds, have grown since the year 2000 three times faster than the economy, much faster than public companies, much faster than small business, much faster than banks, uh, much faster than insurance companies. They've been growing year after year at a compound average growth rate of about 15%, which is pretty astonishing sustained growth. All right, so that's fact one. And then fact two, and this is what makes it a problem, the fact that you've got a sector growing so what? Both of these kinds of funds do better the bigger they are. They really enjoy Walmart-like economies of scale. Vanguard is able to do what they do, and, and, and let me just say right off the bat, 
I'm a huge Vanguard fan. Uh, Bogle, who founded it, and I were buddies before he passed away. We, I, I totally love the Vanguard product. Um, and in part, I'm writing the book because I don't want the product to get crushed by politics, which may happen. And the reason it may happen is because Vanguard does so well, the bigger it gets, the cheaper the fees it can charge, that attracts more money, they do better, they get bigger, they just keep getting bigger. It's, a, it's basically an endless cycle. They, 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 together with the other three, now own, already own, today, sitting here today, 25% of all the stock of every company that's listed on a stock exchange. And it was like five in, 1990 or less. It, that's the growth. And, it, and, and the things that are contributing to that growth are not going away. There's nothing in the financial marketplace that's going to stop them from continuing to grow. All right. So if that growth continues, in 10 years, they're going to own more than half of all the shares of all the companies on every stock exchange. If you own more than half the stock, you decide who's on the board. If you decide who's on the board, you run the company. Now, to be clear, they don't do it in a formal, hands-on way, and frankly, I suspect they would really rather not be in charge. They, that's not really their business, but it comes with the money they run. All right, so that's index funds. That's the first problem. They're doing so well, they're creating a problem for themselves. Private equity funds, very different model. They don't buy single shares of stock for you, for ordinary individuals. They collect money from big institutions, they borrow, and then they buy whole companies. And then they hold onto them five to 10 years, generally try to make more money out of them and then resell them. That was the traditional model when I was a young lawyer. They still do that, but they now do it so well and so effectively that they're basically in charge of 20% of the entire U.S. economy. Those are not the companies the index funds own. They own the publicly traded shares of Apple and Exxon and the like. Private equity, they buy the whole company. So you and I can't buy at the same time as them. They just own the entire company. One in seven or eight of every worker in the entire U.S. economy now works for private equity. That, again, is a total transformation from the year 2000. It, they, they were important in the year 2000, but they were not 20% of the entire economy. Same problem with index funds. The bigger they get, the better they are at it. And so they get concentrated. So the big four private equity, something like $3 trillion in assets. The typical private equity fund, the, like the routine ones, $100 million, nothing. It's the big guys. And so in both cases, I'm now going to sum up, these two kinds of funds were around in 1970, but they were minor. Since year 2000, they've been getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that they largely are coming to control our entire economy. There's 12 people that run them. That's probably not a good place to land for 12 people to be able to have that much influence over our entire economy. They're already getting political blowback. And, and now let me flip it back around. Remember I said I love Vanguard. I, I don't want the political response to the political threat they pose to destroy their ability to do a good financial job because they manage some of my money. I want them to keep doing that. Um, but they are also now increasingly having political power that, that we have to figure this out as a country. We, how do we let them keep doing the financial job they do so well without basically dictating the way the entire economy runs in a, in, in a single group? All right, I'm done. That's, cool. That's great. It's excellent. And uh, and just you know, for anyone who, who might wonder, um, for a lot of our longtime members, we more often cover geopolitics. Uh, we have the most recent you know NATO Supreme Allied Commander next week talking about Ukraine war. We have Chinese dissident two weeks after that, a Russian dissident uh, three weeks after that. Um, in in broad strokes, can you talk about why it is important for the American economy to remain relatively open, relatively flexible, um, to have degrees of disclosure, especially when we're in, if you want to call it, a, an emerged or emerging Cold War, where political and economic models for how the rest of the world, the developing world, might proceed, they might look to a Chinese model or to American model, and if our model is in economic chaos. Hey, if you're you know some 
autocrat and country XYZ, maybe you say, well, the Chinese model's not too bad. Right. So the, the, the clash, fundamentally, that I'm sketching in the book, and, and let me just say, I don't profess to have a magic solution to the problem. Uh, I wish I did. I wouldn't call it a problem. I'd be preaching to you about the solution. But instead, I'm just telling you there's a problem. We've got to deal with it. So the problem is incredible value from the economies of scale in finance, but a commitment in a democratic republic to separation of power, checks and balances, no one small group having dominance over the entire economy. That model actually sounds a lot like those other models you're talking about. And you know the fact that they're not ideologically committed to a particular vision of, say, what Marx wanted, doesn't mean that it's not a problem anyway. So I, 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 this is a fundamental clash. We've seen it before, by the way. So the one may be silver lining, good, good, you know, a little bit of blue in the sky here, is we we've, we've seen this story before. Um, Originally, banks in the U.S. played this role, and the law ended up restricting what banks can do. Today, banks are not allowed to own non-financial companies. Citigroup can't buy Apple, just by law. We, we said, all right, look, you can do banking. You can be big banks. We, we, we have our problems with banks anyway, 2008. But um, nevertheless, we don't have the problem of them controlling our entire economy. Insurance companies in the late 19th century, early 20th, started buying up more and more of the, of the economy. They had the same economies of scale. Insurance is a better business at massive scale because you can pool more risk. Right? You think about insurance companies, you want them to be big, right? But we realized as a democracy, it was not a good idea for a small number of insurance companies to control every other company. So we passed laws starting in New York and then moving around the country, and I believe in Texas too, major insurance companies are not allowed to buy large amounts of stock of other companies. So we've been through this before. Now, that fix, a ban, doesn't work with index funds because the whole point of them is to buy stock. So we, that, that's not the solution. We're going to have to come up with another solution. Um, and if we don't, I worry, you're right, it will create a series, I think, of, I think it'll make people suspicious of the funds. They're already suspicious. We can talk about why. I also think it will tempt some politicians, and I'm going to be studiously neutral here. Um, both Republican and Democrat parties have politicians in them who will be tempted to run on the platform of crushing one or the other funds here in ways that I don't think are good for uh, ultimately the public. So we, we need to both worry about the political response and also the threat that the institutions pose. Um, you know, you think historically of the U.S., you know, the Gilded Age, the robber barons, the total domination of certain sectors of the economy, you know, railroads by, by a small few, the 1870s and 80s and in the 90s, um, led to Teddy Roosevelt, probably one of the, the strongest kind of, you know, populist, but also presidents willing to take on big governments. Uh, you know, a generation later, we have the Great Depression, um, FDR steps in some of the, the biggest, most sweeping kind of progressive changes in U.S. history that kind of created the model we had until this index fund model and private equity fund is kind of changing the managerial kind of format of, of, of management for companies. Um, what are your concerns that those were rough and difficult political times and economic times for the country that from both the left, whether it's Bernie Sanders or from the right, uh, Donald Trump, um, there are a lot of people in the country who feel left behind and left out, and that the elite doesn't care about them, these companies don't care about them, and this is just further proof to most people that if we don't address some of these economic inequalities, that uh, politically we're in for a kind of you know, one, one dangerous ride. I, you're, you're making exactly the right point about the timing of this. Like, it, it, it'd be one thing if we were in a time when our political system was less divided and less suspicious, but, but it's not. As you've alluded to, we've got some real problems, putting aside my problem, uh, the one that I'm raising. And, and so I, that's part of why I worry about the political um, response to the growth of these funds. I, I would say both in types of funds could help themselves. And I've made this pitch to them in 
some of the trade representatives get it and others don't. We'll keep talking about it. I think they both could benefit with more disclosure, particularly private equity funds. I think private equity funds from the beginning have been designed to not make disclosure. Like the entire industry on some level is structured around not having to report anything to anyone other than the small group of investors, which are typically pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. So their own investors are other institutions, and that's the only people they're used to talking to. They've gotten too big for that in my view. I think they've gotten too big to remain completely unwilling to make some disclosures to the public. If they don't, again, the political threat to them, and, and here I'll, I'll pick on my former colleague Liz Warren, whose politics are not mine, but nevertheless, she makes a lot of political hay out of attacking private equity, and it's only going to get worse as they get bigger. The private equity industry particularly, I think, runs some risks as it's taken over industries like Healthcare, um, retirement homes, my mother-in-law right now, we're shopping, and part of our internal household dynamic, I will just confess to you, and this is not me selling a book, this is genuinely my wife and my, my relatives, all you know, private equity, I don't know, do we want to put her in a private equity-owned uh, home? That's a bad thing in, in, already in our household, so they're already suffering some consumer public suspicion, and part of that is because they don't report anything. They deliberately choose not to. All right, so that's private equity. Index funds, likewise, on the other side of it, um, Texas governor has gone after the index funds, if you guys didn't track this. Um, index funds have been pushing companies to be more green in their approach to energy. Now. Whatever you think of that, I suspect there might be some disagreement in the room about whether that's good or bad as a matter of public policy. Here's what's not, I don't think you can really argue. Two people at Vanguard should, be make, should not be making that decision on behalf of their 15 million clients, customers that put money through Vanguard. It should be a matter of public debate about whether public companies are pushed by the public to go one way or the other. The shareholders who own those shares through Vanguard right now get very little ability to know about in advance how Vanguard is thinking and to have very little input into the way Vanguard approaches the problem. It's unfortunately playing out to the political um, sphere. And I, I you know, I, I'm not gonna say anything bad about the Texas governor while in Texas, <laughs> but he's intervening in the market in a way that I, through the political sphere, that I'm not so sure is that great. I would rather the index funds themselves figure out how to better inform their customers than to have the government telling them how to vote. I, I think it would be a bad idea to have Liz Warren or the governor of Texas telling either type of fund how to run themselves. I think they should do a better job themselves and that starts to me with disclosure. More information about what you're doing to the public be more open about it, and I think then the politics, the political fear would fall, and then we could manage it a little bit better. And just to stay on index funds, and then we'll move to private equity, um, I think some of the examples in these books are kind of eye-opening and amazing. Uh, it's from a few years ago, and it's still incredible, kind of astonishing that it, it happened. Can you talk about the case of, at the time, Exxon, which had you know assets of about 300 billion at the time, in essence, kind of taking a step back to a small um, uh, fund that basically had one fiftieth of one percent of its equity, um, but it was because of these index funds and their their kind of behind the scenes influence and capability to, to get people to do what they want. Yeah. So some of you may know this story. Exxon a couple years ago was stumbling. They weren't doing that great as a matter of financial returns. They were an outlier among the majors in how much exploration they were doing and capital expenditure they were putting into more production. And a little tiny San Francisco-based hedge fund called Engine Number no. One, which was basically created to do this, went after their board and nominated four people to go on the Exxon board. No one at the beginning of that thought they had a, even the slightest chance of winning, and I'm quite sure the Exxon board just kind of ignored them at first. And then they started hearing, the Exxon board and the public started hearing, actually, some of the index funds think there's something to this. 
They really ought to be paying more attention to transition risk and what's going on in Washington and why are they an outlier and, and how come you've been losing money for the last year. And slowly it dawned on the Exxon board, they might lose. So the Exxon board, even before the vote, added a couple of people to the Exxon board to try to stave off this proxy fight. And even despite that, Exxon lost three of those board seats. And they lost those board seats not because the San Francisco little fund bought enough stock to control Exxon. They never did, as you said. It was less, it was less than half a percent. It was because they went into a room, or got on a phone call, a Zoom probably, and convinced less than 12 people, probably five people, at three funds, to switch their votes from supporting Exxon to going with this little fund. So that's the problem of 12. Like basically within you know, the space of a year, you went from Exxon counting on the way running itself that it always run it, or just re-nominating itself, picking some people, so, you know, it wasn't like they were totally static, to having outsiders dictate to them who goes on their board. That's been a, a pretty astonishing exercise of power there. And you know, in the book, you talk about how index funds and then and later <clears throat> private equity do a pretty incredible job of walking the line between um, you know kind of controlling versus influencing a company what they would do. Um, I'm just thinking of another kind of real world example. Um, in recent weeks, you know, some Republicans and Democrats, one thing bipartisan agreement was is on the Biden administration's decision to restrict American companies investing in. Uh, companies that either directly or indirectly work with Chinese defense industries or cyber industries or AI industries or chip makers. Um, but the one huge notable you know, uh, exception to all that, for instance, is that it, there's no restrictions on what index funds can do. So they have multiple times more of, of billions of dollars to invest and, and they're able to keep investing how they like. Yeah, so the both fund industries are very good at the lobbying game in Washington. I mean, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of smart lobbyists, they know how to spot things that are coming their way, and they're pretty good at getting exemptions or finding ways to work around whatever um, other kinds of regulations are coming their way. I, you know, you know, I, they have to, that's part of the business. Um, you live in a, a country that's full of regulation and full of sometimes re-regulation and sometimes deregulation. You, you have to play in that game. I don't blame them for that. But their ability to do that, I think, is, is contributing to some of the public skepticism about how they function, both on the index fund side and on the private equity fund side. Um, you know, also under, under, underappreciated about some of the trade moves, um, private equity is also, and the companies they own are often getting carved out of them as well. And, and if 20% of your economy is basically able to take itself out of public policy, that's a problem in and of itself. So. Um, and, and just turning out of private equity, um, can you discuss kind of in some ways why it's maybe even more concerning index funds because they are purposefully and unconsciously uh, you know, kind of dark, or as you, as you say in the book, drawing a veil over the, the, the economy and, and dark to, to the public for a lot of what they do. Um, but can you talk about the process they go through um, when they do take over a company? Um, often they, they take on huge amounts of debt, which they need cash flow, and sometimes the fastest, easiest way to balance your books is to lay off a lot of people and, and those cascading effects within the economy um, and, and what it could mean. Yeah, so... Two things about private equity, one again that's relatively new since 2000. When I was a, a young lad, private equity funds would buy a company, they would engage in layoffs, and that's just part of their operating model, often frankly good for the company in the sense of there's, there's excess of these, a lot of companies they take over. Um, and then they would resell the company back to the public markets. And it, so it was sort of a disciplinary effect they would have. Um, what's new is they don't take them public anymore, for the most part. They just sell them to another private equity fund, or increasingly to themselves. They take a company that is in one fund, and then they sell it to another fund that the very same private equity firm manages. Um, that raises some conflict of interest issues that are pretty obvious, but more importantly, it means that these companies never come back into public view. 
So it used to be that you know you could count on, all right, private equity is going to go in, they're going to do what they do, and then they're going to come public again, and we can watch the business and see that it's actually functioning in a publicly good way, in a way that's actually good for the overall economy. Now, they're just kind of going into a black hole, and they stay there. And sometimes they go bankrupt often. They take risk with the debt they raise, and that's part of the private equity model too. I'm not here to say debt is a bad thing, but they, they push it. Right? Part of the whole model is to push the debt as far as they can, and they don't bear all the consequences when it goes bad. Their employees do, sometimes the pension investors that invest in their equity fund do. Um, that's part of the private equity model too. And ironically for a business which is founded on financial returns, that's the pitch, you can't test the risk that they run because they don't report publicly. Now, They'll say, well, our investors are big funds, they can protect themselves. This is the standard line they give, and, and there's some truth to that. Pension funds are probably better off gauging the risk than you or I would be individually. But let me ask you this. In 2008, what happened to the pension funds? They lost a lot of money. Big institutions are perfectly capable of misestimating the risk that they put their money in. And so I don't believe, frankly, that total darkness around financial returns that affect millions of people. Because pension funds, after all, invest for millions of people. They invest for retirees, they, work, they invest for workers, they invest for uh, the public largely. I don't trust the people running pension funds well enough to have private equity on the other side of the table with them with no insight for the rest of us to see how they're doing. That's, that's my take. More disclosure would be, I think, a good first step. Um. And you know, as you know, it's, it's staggering to think private equity now controls about $12 trillion worth of assets, uh, which is a, a number that's hard to put your, your head around. Um, you mentioned that sometimes you buy these companies, it's not no longer you know, taking it private and then putting it public again. It's cycling through themselves or cycling with other private equity companies. Um, can you talk about the real concerns of collusion and the kind of uh, you know, kind of anti-competitive natures, not quite cartel-like concerns, but they're definitely concerns um, that these companies perhaps are being bought at a lower value than the shareholders should get, that they're getting a lower percentage than they should have got when, when the company's bought out, uh, and that you know these companies work together to just pick and choose which big companies they may or may not bid on. I think one of the most startling, I'll just quote it, because it's, I think it's an amazing quote. It, it came up from a lawsuit, obviously it wasn't said uh, publicly, but the president of Blackstone, uh, the largest private equity fund with you know, assets of over a trillion, and it, I think it was an email to KRR with uh, half of, you know, 500 billion in assets, said, together we could be unstoppable, but in opposition we cost each other a lot of money. Can you talk about the issues and concerns of collusion? Yeah, this is the part where my friends from private equity don't like this part of the book. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, look, there, there is Adam Smith, actually, great capitalist theoretician, pointed out that you get a few business people in a room in the same industry, and the first thing they do is collude with each other. It's just human nature. Um, it's just, and that's why we have antitrust laws, and that's why we have antitrust um, agencies that are supposed to stop that. And, and you know you can fight about whether there's too much or too little enforcement at any given point in time. But when the industry itself, when the funds themselves are getting to the scale they're getting at, and they're really the big ones who are getting more and more control over more and more of the economy, the consequences of that collusion become greater, the temptations become greater, and the ability to know about it in advance or real time for the government enforcement agencies becomes a lot lower. Um, this is, again, just flip of what I was talking about on the political side, except now it's on the business side. Private equity is brilliant at spotting an industry that's not yet been consolidated, that is still pretty fragmented and pretty competitive. And then they buy a few, companies and then they roll them up and they do it fast enough sometimes that it's kind of frankly our government is not the most nimble sometimes and the government just can't keep up with what they're doing and then all of a sudden you've got a much more consolidated industry so there I, I don't think this part of it is new it's Adam Smith it's an old problem but what is new is how quickly and how effectively they can um, do that on the index fund side 
it's a little different. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm not myself enough of an economist to know who's right or wrong about this. But I will say, if you run an airline and you have a competitor airline across town uh, and you're in and out of the same airports, again, you'd like to collude, you'd like all else equal to not have to fight each other on price. That's illegal, you know that, okay. Uh, you're not allowed to go into a, you know, a restaurant and agree not to compete. Um, now, what happens if the same four index funds buy 40% of your stock and 40% of the other guy's stock? And then those index funds, they no longer have an interest in your competing with each other because they'll be better off too if you don't compete. And you know that, and you know they're going to be examining not whether you make money yourself as a company, but whether they make money as owners of the two airlines together. Or put differently, when you have that much concentrated ownership, which index funds are creating, it reduces the incentive to compete at the company level. Now, there's a fierce debate among economists about whether this is, I don't think anybody thinks it's false, but they, they're not sure how true it is. Um, but it's enough of a worry that it just adds to the political concerns on the index fund side as well. There, and I, I will say there have been proposals as a result of this to just cap index funds. They can no longer own more than you know, 2%, 3% of any one company. I, I'm not sure if that's a good or bad idea. And I, I need a lot more thinking to be, to be before I feel convinced one way or the other about it. But it is a side effect of their growth, and that is something we need to face up to. Okay, Ed, I just want to do two more quick questions and turn to the, the audience questions. We, we've discussed probably more the economics of it than the, the politics that we discussed, but um, maybe just to give a, a kind of another specific example for how people relate. Um, there are Republicans might feel be harder on index funds than Democrats, Democrats might be harder on private equity than Republicans. Um, but maybe could you talk about one example where it seemed like there was agreement. One of the few things probably both Biden and Trump agreed on was eliminating carried interest. And just for people to know, that is most of these huge fund managers are not paid a salary. They're paid a percentage of profits, and then their income for that year is taxed as capital gains at 20%. Uh, instead of what percentage they would be paying for most people who earn 10 or $20 million a year. Um, so in essence, the percentage they're paying in tax is the same as an American who earns between forty and ninety thousand dollars a year in salary. Can you talk about how it is that that seemingly easy political agreement was never able to be pushed through, and and the power they both have um, to influence politicians on the left and the right? Yeah. So that I mean, it's it's a perfect illustration of the effectiveness of a coherent lobby with the scale that they're at. Right. I mean, they're able to find the one or two members of Congress in both parties to target who are worried about their own reelection and just say, we're going to throw a bunch of money at your enemy if you don't vote our way. And they flip. So Chuck Schumer, sent them on there. They, they, they went against what would otherwise be a pretty easy Democratic Party talking point, raising taxes on the rich. They went the other way. All right, so that's on that side. I will say, to, to give you a similar kind of counterexample on the other side, the reason that I think, um, you know, if you're a Republican and you're convinced that, that, um, that the government shouldn't play a role in sustainability or climate, which is one of the attacks on index funds, guess what private equity funds do? They put out huge reports proclaiming their sustainable um, investment policies. And they were actually first. KKR put out a report on sustainable practices long before public companies did. So um, you can find something to dislike about these funds no matter who you are. <laughs> so if you're a Democrat, they're going to be doing some things with their power that are against your, your beliefs. And if you're a Republican, they're going to be doing some things with their power. And the key point is just how much power they're getting. Right? It really isn't so much about, like, to me, it's not the bottom line impact, which we should be able to debate. And I have views, but um, that's not why I'm writing the book. Um, I'm writing the book because I don't want 12 people making that decision with no disclosure, no discussion, and no public debate. That, that's, that's the thing. And, and lastly, early on we discussed, you know, uh, the Gilded Age, one of the most kind of 
economically unequal periods of American history, uh, this, the changes that brought about, the Great Depression, similar changes. Um, but we had the, the massive recession of 2008, not much happened. Um, index funds and private equity have only gotten stronger and bigger and more politically influential. Do you think it's gonna take something as massive as the Great Depression to finally get political change, to finally get a higher degree of transparency and kind of you know, policy openness? Well, I, it's interesting that 2008 did not make much of a dent in the growth of either type of fund. And I think that's largely because neither of them at the time was publicly identified with the major cause of 2008, which was the housing financial markets. And the, those were really bank dominated. And so I, I don't blame these funds for 2008. I don't really think they were principally responsible. They, they didn't help, but they didn't make it worse. What I think will, um, and I do worry about this, I worry that if we have a recession coupled with a stock market downturn as typically happens, and then some scandal associated with either one of these types of funds, that will be the trigger. And, and I, because I believe they're getting too much power, I want there to be some change, but I don't want that political change to happen in a moment when everyone is panicked because that can produce really bad outcomes. Uh, I, I can go back to my friend Jack Bogle. I promised him before, um, the last time I saw him, uh, that I would, I, would, um, I would help Vanguard continue to do what it does. And so what I'm really after is helping the public see enough of this problem to lean on Vanguard now, keep leaning on Vanguard now, figure this out, figure out a way that you can keep doing a good indexing uh, fund investment job without accumulating so much political power. So that's my okay. That's my and, and like you said, you say in the book, you're an ardent supporter of capitalism and, and 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 strong companies and having the ability to raise funds and uh, and grow. Um, and you're not looking to throw the baby out of the bathwater, but to get in a few more kind of solutions, a few people kind of along those lines, maybe you could touch upon um, uh, regards to voting. Someone asks. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on funds delegating voting rights to their investors on a pro rata basis, I suppose, as opposed to just the fund making it collectively? Um, and then uh, what about eliminating cross-board directorships for private equity principles? So the, the last one, I think, is actually should, should already be the right view of the law. So uh, we've long had a law that says if you're on the board of Exxon, you can't be on the board of Conoco. I mean, you, like that's just too 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 obvious of a way for you to collude if you're on two boards of two competing companies. It's not really been rigorously applied within the private equity world, and it should be. So that that one I'm with totally is easy. Um, the pass through voting for index funds, I don't think works, and here's why. There are four thousand companies. How many of you are going to read four thousand? You know, choices about which directors. I mean, I. I don't open my mutual fund voting statements as it is because I'm too busy. And so I don't think a pass-through, like a simple pass-through would work because the effect of that would be either they wouldn't vote at all if the rule was they don't get to vote unless you tell them how. And since most people wouldn't tell them, they would lose their votes. If you take all the votes away from the index funds, the practical effect yes, is to lower their power, but it's also going to have weird effects because it will mean other shareholders will suddenly get more power and in unpredictable ways, in ways that will change over time. So I just, I don't think that's a good solution. Um, what they are experimenting with, which I do think has promise, is to let their own customers, individuals who invest through them, kind of tell them once a year, here's more or less the kind of voting policy I want you to follow and then give you know, 12 maybe choices or five or some number of choices and you could, but it would apply to all the votes. So it would just basically be, you know, I kind of want you to do whatever management says if you're very, if you think management of every company is great, you could choose that. Or you could follow a different proxy advisory service. There are a couple of them out there already. I want you to vote the way they do or I trust you. I think you've been doing a great job. You keep voting the way you want to. So a series of policies like that, and you could choose amongst them. A little bit like platforms of parties um, would be the idea um, in the financial space. I think that would be a more promising okay. solution. And just to kind of follow up on a good question from uh, Donnie, um, 
uh, asking about transparency. Um, can you discuss the new FASB, maybe you can just let people know what that is, ruling to add more information to financial statements and just in a broader sense, if you could you know, expound yeah. upon transparency concerns. Sure, I mean, I, I worked at the Securities and Exchange Commission and I, I went there because before I went there, I fully believed that fraud is bad. <laughs> I hope you do too. Fraud is bad. Um, when fraud happens, not only is there a loss to the person who's defrauded, but they often suffer dramatically after that. Their families suffer, anyone who's dependent on them. It's a massively bad thing. The Madoff scandal, horrible for everyone connected to it, every single part. So I believe fully in the mission of the SEC, and I believe in disclosure. All right. FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, has long been given the job of doing the accounting disclosure an attempt to be non-political. They're not a political body, in theory. Um, but sadly, in my view, for the last 15 years, they've been politicized into total inaction. The last 12 years, the FASB has done almost nothing. They've watched the entire economy pivot from an old manufacturing economy to an economy in which human capital and people and the ideas that people bring to businesses, that's where the value is. If you look at the major companies in the US these days, it's you know, the tech sector, it's healthcare, it's financial services, it's sectors where the accounting profession does not account. The FASB does, has no coherent way to approach the value at a company like Apple. So I'm delighted that finally FASB now seems to be serious about taking up that challenge. It's not a simple, uh, it's not easy. Like I, I don't mean, it, it'll take them years of sustained work to come up with better ways of disclosing what kinds of value humans bring to the companies they work for, but there are ways to do it, like simple things, like how much turnover you have in your workforce should be publicly reported. There's no reason not for, you know, from an investor perspective, first thing you want to know, I did M&A, I remember for 10 years at Wachtell, we advised lots of financial companies. You go into do, doing your investigation of a company, you want to know what the turnover is in the workforce. That's not disclosed in the current disclosure regime. So I, I think FASB's, I'm glad they're finally moving in that project. It's not really connected to the book, but I'm happy to, uh, to preach about it. And uh, I definitely recommend you all buy the book. You can learn a lot more. And you discuss it in the book, but maybe just briefly, you could give some of the, the kind of most pertinent points. Someone asked a good question. What changed in the microeconomic and or regulatory environment that caused the accelerated growth of index funds and private equity in the 2000s? Yeah, so index funds, what's interesting is nothing really changed, actually. What changed was it just took the industry 20 years to convince everyone that their very counterintuitive idea actually was right. You know, the index fund, in case those of you who haven't thought about it or use it, it's an interesting product. They come to you and they say, give us your money and we'll invest for you. But we're not actually going to pick the stocks. We're just going to buy every company there is. We're going to buy every company on the major index. And we're not even going to think about it. We're literally not going to think about it. We're not going to pay anyone to think about what stocks to buy. We're going to go the other way. We're going to have no one on staff to do that. Therefore, we can charge you a very, very low fee to buy all the companies. All right. Now, why is that a good idea? Why wouldn't it make sense to pay a professional to think about stocks? Well, it turns out picking stocks is really hard. And most people who try fail. So for most of us, we're not only trying to pick the stocks in a, in a sense, we're picking the people who are picking the stocks, that's even harder. So while there are people who can beat the market, it's really hard to figure out who they are, even after the fact, because there's so much noise in the stock market, you can look at three or four years of good returns, it might just be luck, actually. In fact, it usually is luck. So what the index funds offered starting in 1975 is we're not going to try to do that. We're just going to do a really simple thing and buy all the companies and we'll give you the market return and we'll charge you almost nothing for it. Right? So that's their pitch. It took them, I think, 25 years to convince people. Um, and, it, and, and the way they did it was they kept beating most money managers year after year on average until you had 25 years of data to show it. Look, we're doing better than them and we're charging a lower fee. And if you don't believe me, Warren Buffett, um, gives that advice to LeBron James uh, seven years ago. LeBron James at $300 million at the time wanted advice about how to invest. As you may know, many athletes are terrible at investing and they get wiped out in their 
in their later lives. And Buffett told James, put it in an index fund, just invest every month. And he did. And according to the news reports, I wasn't in the room, but, um, <laughs> and James is now worth, he's tripled his money. You know, and it's because it's because he didn't pay anybody to try to beat the market. He just got the market return over the time. All right, so that's that's index funds. Nothing really changed other than basically people coming around to that idea. Private equity funds. There was a major change. 1996, in a completely unnoticed change at the time, Congress passed a law that basically allowed private equity funds and hedge funds to get to almost any size. Before that, they could only raise money from basically 100 institutions, and that limited their size fairly dramatically. They now can raise money from an unlimited number of, of institutions, and that simple change uh, uh, allowed them to get to the scale they're at. So. And you touched upon it some of the book, um, the last 30, 40 years, continuing declines in the power of, of organized labor of unions. Is, is that a factor too, or in some ways have these huge funds been the reason for some of those declines in the, in the power of, of labor? I, you know, both of their, the growth in private equity index uh, comes after really the decline of the uh, private sector union in the U.S. So I don't really, I don't, they're not really causally connected to it. But, but I do think they, they arrive at a moment when, um, you know, labor is an historically weak, they're, they're, they're struggling now to try to come back up again. And, and as a result of that, the, the, the influence that these funds have over business and over the economy really has nothing on the other side to push against. And that's part of the reason that private equity can come in and just lay a whole bunch of people off and, and, and keep running the business the way they do. So it's sort of essential to their business model that the labor movement is as weak as it is. And I do think that's part of the reason that a completely opaque industry is even worse than it otherwise would be because a lot of people are getting laid off in the dark, basically. We, we don't know about it. Okay, just, uh, uh, just two more questions, and we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the, the book signing, which would be great. Um, uh, someone asked me related to ESG, you know, environmental, social, and governmental initiatives, um, often deliver inferior results, but simultaneously channel activity. Um, smaller funds complain this limits competition and reinforces existing companies' positions and the fund's own positions. Uh, do you agree or disagree? Um, and maybe just, it gives us a little bit more the kind of the idea of these large activist investors. So the ESG as an acronym was invented about 20 years ago at the UN to try to get banks together originally, banks together about certain kinds of um, policies of companies that they went to. And then it's kind of become its own thing in the world. Um, I, I personally, I, I don't, like, it, it's too, it's one of these, it's a political phrase. It's always been a political phrase. It doesn't really have meaning unless you drill down. Like, what are you talking about exactly? All right, now some of the things that come under ESG are like totally benign. It's like, um, you know, um, pay attention to your own risk, financial risk of a certain kind that's connected to a certain kind of um, environmental uh, harm you might cause. Like, who would argue with that? that? That, of course, is responsible corporate governance to pay attention because in the end you may pay fines or may get shut down. And then there's another version of that same thing, which is totally change the way you're doing business, give up on whole lines of, you know, give up profit, sacrifice profit in order to pursue environmental goals. Obviously, those two things are both E, but they mean totally different things. And so that ESG as an overall acronym, I think, confuses things more than it clarifies. The big index funds, I will say, part of their problem is they've picked certain specific kinds of ESG-related ideas, and they back them. And then they pick others, and they resist them. So they're making bets with your money at the company level, changing the way companies behave. And I would predict that none of the big four are doing it exactly the way that many of you in the room, like in both directions, in all directions, uh, would want. And you don't even know about it. So Vanguard backed the Exxon directors who were put up. One of them was a sustainability person, right? So that's sort of a greenish position. 
But then Vanguard voted against all the environmental proposals that were up this past year that were not climate related. That's anti-environmental. So if you're an environmentalist, you like them for one and don't like them for the other. Did you know about it until I just said that? And are you at all involved or being consulted about how they're deciding which is a good idea, which is a bad idea? And I'll say one more. Um, State Street um, supported the shareholder resolution at Starbucks to get them to do a study of their labor practices. It's part of the labor struggle Starbucks is having. So if you like unions, you, you like State Street. BlackRock and Vanguard voted against it. You should be against them there. But then I'll, I'll find you another company where same kind of issue, labor issue comes up and their votes are not the same. And yet again, they're, they're having labor effects with your money on those companies um, in a way that I think needs, it needs more information. There needs to be more disclosure about it ahead of time in some way that we can all understand because they're frankly having more of an effect than Washington on these issues. Right? I mean, you know that. I mean, Washington is paralyzed on most dimensions. The index funds are doing things that you cannot get done through your elected representatives. Okay, just uh, in closing, there are uh, two questions that are related, but on, but on different scale. Um, there's a name for the first one, but someone asked, you know, what can we do as an investor uh, with regards to these issues? And then on, on a bigger uh, level, uh, Anna asks, um, what will it actually take to make meaningful reform in antitrust legislation uh, in terms of these monopolistic interests? So as an investor, um, at a minimum, you can at least you know, make sure you understand which index fund you're in or, or what have you. They do report on their votes. So you can, you know, with, without too much work, find out if you're interested on a particular issue on a particular company, find out. But of course, there are 4,000 companies, and you're not going to do that um, kind of research, probably. I don't even do that. Um, and I spend all my time thinking about this. Um, um, the second thing you can do is, um, I think they're going to increasingly be forced to market themselves in part on these issues. They're going to be have they're going to be pushed to say, "What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about that?" And then you can make a choice because they're basically offering all the same product. An index fund is an index fund is an index fund if the fees the same and the fees are all pretty tightly similar to each other. So here's a point of differentiation. You can pick one that you like better on some of these issues, and maybe you don't always like their votes. And this is actually, I think, going to be a, a investor-oriented change that's going to play out over the next five to ten years. Now, meaningful change. Um, this is the hard part of the problem. Um, I want to preserve them, but I also want to control them. So I want there to be more regulation, but I don't want it to be so much that they can't keep delivering the index fund product. Um, some of the proposals are bad ones. I, I testified in the Senate a year ago, if you're interested, you can go read my testimony. But I, so here's some, there are some things out there that I think are just bad ideas. I think the things that are likely to be meaningful and good are requiring the index funds to, in advance, tell the public, tell us, what they're thinking about on major new issues. And if they post that and journalists pick up on it, then we can all look at it and give them our input and influence them. I think that's meaningful change uh, in a way that's practical, that will preserve it. So that's my take on that. Private equity, they just need to start making more disclosures. Now that's, that's a whole, we could spend two more hours talking about that. I won't do that. All right, well, will you all join me in thanking uh, Professor John Coates?